Thank you everyone for being here for the latest event in our spirituality series. My name is Jessica Colligan and I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of Fairfield's Office of Alumni Relations. I'm pleased to be joined this evening by Father Jerry Blazczyk, who is our Vice President for Mission and Ministry, and Father Tom Simiski, who many of you know from his tenure as President at Fairfield Prep. Just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Please make sure your microphones remain muted throughout the conversation just to minimize any distraction. And second, if you do have any questions that you would like Father Simiski to answer, please feel free to use the chat feature in Zoom and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. And now without further ado, I will hand things over to Father Jerry to get things started. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, as those of you who have been, <clears throat> excuse me, following our conversations for the last, um, the last few months, this uh, series uh, is offered under the aegis <clears throat> of Murphy Center Campus Ministry and especially the Office of Alumni Affairs as a spirituality um, uh, series. Now, it's interesting and I think terribly apt that the way we approach spirituality is through people's experience, the lives of human beings. Uh, and our, our intention is that those of you who are interested and who have a long experience of Ignatian or Jesuit spirituality, you know that this is experience-based and the way we can see its characteristics is best through the lives of people who live them. And in this series, we're focusing especially on some Jesuits whom you know. And the man behind this beard is our beloved Tom Samiski. Tom, if you didn't catch it in the beginning uh, when there was some uh, banter before we began, Tom is claiming that every gray beard on his face has a name from prep uh, <laughs> or has a particular date uh, or incident uh, whether or not that's true, Tom, we're thrilled to have you among us. Uh, Tom, uh, although so many people who were here this evening are here because they know you from prep or they know you from other moments in your life, I doubt that there are many people here who know how, uh, how really interesting and uh, varied is your experience that you brought to prep. So much of uh, what brought you such immense success, so much that uh, explains your skills as a spiritual leader can be traced back to your own family history and to your own personal history way before you entered the Society of Jesus. Tom, I wonder whether you can tell us a little bit about who you are, where you came from, and then leading up to how you met the Society of Jesus. Sure, I'm happy to, Jerry. And uh, again, thanks to all of you for having me on here this evening. I'm on the West Coast right now, Portland, Oregon. So uh, late afternoon here on, uh, in our time zone. Uh, also, some may have been looking at the flyer for this and seeing this nice, clean-shaven young man and saying, wait, there's been some sort of bait and switch for what just happened. So I have the Pacific Northwest look going on right now, kind of enjoying uh, this. And I'm in the stage called tertianship, which is this final stage of Jesuit formation. I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Uh, but again, really happy to come back and talk to the Fairfield community, both Fairfield Prep, Fairfield University, and uh, in all of its uniqueness, uh, you know, Fairfield Prep is the only Jesuit high school that is a division of the university. And so, you know, what a great uh, blessing that was for six years to be part of the Fairfield family and uh, to take all of that with me. As, as I was laughing beforehand that, yeah, a lot of this, I think some of the white hairs in my beard came from some stressful days, and there were certainly a few working in a high school. Uh, but what you do walk away with and, and what remains, other than just that look, uh, is are all the joyful memories and, and the good people. And I have had the chance to uh, make a 30-day silent retreat, the spiritual exercises here, and to really bring to prayer all that happened over those six years at Fairfield. Uh, for me, it was really, uh, it was a great fit. You know, I was, I was born in Worcester, Massachusetts. So certainly a New Englander by heart and uh, went to uh, a Catholic high school, the uh, Zavarian Brothers High School, that was a lot like Fairfield Prep. It was St. John's in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts, all boys, again, Zavarian Brothers, so run by a religious order, and the school colors were red and white. So I felt like I fit right in coming to Fairfield Prep. From there, I went to Assumption College in Worcester, uh, which is actually now named Assumption University. I have to get used to saying that they just changed this summer to their new name. Uh, but uh, again, a great experience there in Catholic education. Uh, easy choice for me. My mom was a secretary at Assumption University, 
And so I had a free education. Uh, so a great education to graduate with no student debt. I mean, what a great gift. And then I went in the Marine Corps after that. And I went to Officer Candidate School in Quantico, Virginia. Uh, had a great four years. And really, I, I entered the Marine Corps wanting to do four years of service. One of those things that most men in my family had done military service. Uh, certainly my, my, my dad served in the Air Force. And uh, it was great to, to continue that tradition and you know, serve our country in that important way. And really gain incredible leadership experience at such a young age. Here I was, you know, 22 years old and thrown right into this, probably the best leadership course in the world, uh, training Marine officers. Uh, I'll also say this fall, I was down at Holy Trinity Parish, part of Georgetown University uh, and down in DC. And I had the chance to go back to Quantico, Virginia for the first time in, I forget how many years, almost 30 years. Uh, so it was pretty neat to, to bring that experience uh, full circle again. Uh, but again, to have been trained in that leadership that I was applying on a daily basis at Fairfield Prep, you know, just uh, having to be able to lead uh, those young men, the students, uh, and our great, outstanding uh, faculty and staff there. And, um, you know, I do, I do feel a call in my own life towards leadership. And this type of, as a Jesuit, this servant leadership, pastoral leadership, that uh, all of my life experiences have helped bring me to that point. And and we'll see what the future brings. But after four years in the Marine Corps, I was an artillery officer. I did serve over in the Gulf, but as a, a pretty peaceful time, I did a, a six month deployment to the Western Pacific and the Persian Gulf. Uh, came back and then for the next three years, I was a district sales manager selling overhead cranes. And so I thought, you know, this is great. I went from this heavy equipment of five ton trucks and howitzers to big cranes. These are the overhead cranes, those big bridge cranes that roll inside factories. And so, uh, that was kind of neat. I was, I was uh, covering the entire Southwest, six Southwestern states. And again, great leadership experience, sales experience, uh, working with interesting people, going inside factories and seeing how America makes stuff, which is pretty amazing. You know, you see, uh, you know, how great our country is. Uh, but three years of that, I was making good money. This was the late 90s because, uh, I, you know, I served in the Marines 92 to 96. This was 96 to 99. But not feeling entirely satisfied with um, with my life, and you know, those questions come kind of like, "What am I doing?" Actually, I'm just you know selling cranes. But what really am I doing to make the world a better place? And feeling that same sense of service that I felt as as a marine. And I look back to my time, and I thought, you know, when did I feel most satisfied in my life? It was when I was actually deployed overseas, where. You know, I like being an officer of Marines, which is basically you're a teacher, your trainer all the time, working with these young men and women, uh, being deployed, having this, this mission, a uh, mission bigger than yourself, a mission that you're willing to sacrifice yourself for. Uh, and I like living in community, you know, whether it's in barracks or on ship, but I like community life. And so I can see now sort of a proto Jesuit vocation present in, in my story. But the next step for me was certainly not into the Jesuits because, uh, that was still unthinkable at this point in my life, but to go to graduate school at Boston College. And I entered the doctoral program in economics at Boston College. I had never heard the word Jesuit in my life, in spite of having grown up tailgating at Holy Cross football games uh, back in Worcester, but I never, never clicked. I knew that BC was a Catholic school, but I didn't, I didn't know the word Jesuit, but I get to BC. I see a story in their paper, the Heights, uh, the student newspaper about the St. Ignatius of Loyola, this Spanish soldier, wild man, hit by a cannonball, big conversion story. And I'm like, man, it's my kind of saint. Like, that, I like this guy. It sounds pretty interesting. Uh, so I start learning more about St. Ignatius, the Jesuits. I go on a week-long retreat through campus ministry at BC. Uh, I start meeting other Jesuits there that were incredibly talented. I, you know, I love the whole, the history, the, this wild missionary history of the Jesuits. And so I actually, a couple of things were going on. One was, here I am in doctoral studies in economics, and I realized that, you know what, I'm actually probably, I'm not as smart as I would like to be. <laughs> so, so this is coming really hard to me. I mean, I was struggling. I could probably have gutted it out and gotten a doctorate, but it would have been just a really hard path. So I thought, you know what, I'll just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to graduate with the master's degree. Uh, which at the time felt like a consolation prize, you know, and it kind of is in, in, the, in certain fields like economics, where you really have to have the doctorate. 
but I, I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to take the, uh, the master's degree, teach in a Catholic high school, to start some discernment. I, I reached out to the vocation director for at that time, the New England province of the Jesuits, uh, began talking with him, uh, seeing a Jesuit for spiritual direction, making more retreats. And then finally, after two years of teaching at Catholic Memorial High School in, in Boston, in West Roxbury, that I decided to enter the Jesuits. And then I entered the Jesuit novitiate in 2003. And so here I've been now a Jesuit for this summer will be 18 years. Um, and really a, a, a tremendous, and we can go into all my different experiences along the way, but uh, it was kind of a windy path to get here, but I can see that God was was with me each step of that that journey as well. Oh, Jerry, you're, you're muted. Thanks, Tom. Um, you talked about, uh, I have to confess, well, you know, I feel like I was raised at Camp Lejeune because my dad, <laughs> my dad uh, is a Marine. And I didn't say was a Marine because my father beat into my head that a Marine is always a Marine. You never say you were a Marine. You, whatever, is, whatever happened in, in, in becoming a Marine is still part of you. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Exactly. One, okay, so how is that the case with you, Tom? You know, and I, I, so that sense of service is certainly always there, the discipline of it. Um, the, uh, yeah, it's, it's just the intensity, I think, also. Uh, so I see so much of that present, uh, but certainly the leadership, and a leadership that is always focused on, it can't be focused on yourself. It's got to be focused on uh, the mission and always caring for the people that you're with. Mm. And so, and, and actually one thing at Fairfield Prep, uh, when I was serving as president there, for me, what was really important is that Fairfield Prep would easily go on without me. In the military, you're always trained that, you know, the real sign of true leadership is how well the unit does after you, right? And you always have to prepare because, you know, the military, uh, what the military is all about, you know, is uh, you might not be there tomorrow. And so you've always got to be able to to, to cultivate leadership, bring people up, and make sure everyone is, is really clear about the mission, uh, certainly commander's intent about how to execute the mission. Uh, and and you're, you're always forming leadership. Leadership is, is, is a sacred duty in the military. It's not just a job, not just a role, but it is seen as something sacred. And, and I, I bring that to um, my life also. Well, then, then, Tom, it must gratify you immensely and confirm you in, in, in Ignatian terms to bring you consolation to see people like Christian Cashman and Tommy de Quesada and Tim D and all the other leaders at uh, Fairfield Prep, whom you helped assume their positions. Well, now, that, we'll get back to that in a second. Right though. There, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, still, Fairfield Prep's doing great right now and uh, tremendous leadership and to have such great Ignatian leaders as as the folks you just mentioned, I mean, uh, Christian has stepped in and and he's taken it well beyond. He certainly he 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 begins as much more qualified than I ever was, and and certainly he is at, is at least as committed to the Jesuit mission of Fairfield Prep as as me or anyone. So to see him, Tommy De Quesada, also to have him at my my uh, my right side this whole time, and then to see him going back to Belen Jesuit, a school that he loves so much, uh, and again to be able to support for me it. I mean, I love Fairfield Prep, but the Jesuit Schools Network is such an important thing. And, and however, I mean, to be able to form leaders and, and spread that leadership out in different places and, and to strengthen our network of Jesuit schools, I think it is the real gift. And, and, and that's our strength. We are more than just one institution, the same way that Fairfield University is part of the uh, AJCU and just part of this larger network of colleges and universities. Um, and and that we realize we're, we're part of a global network. Um, mm. and it, that's a big deal. Tom, you said that when you were at BC, uh, for the first time in your life, you got to know what the word Jesuit meant, but also you met the figure of Ignatius of Loyola and that uh, he was an appealing figure to you, certainly because he was a scallywag, but, uh, and, you know, and, and a bit of a brawler but, uh, in his youth. Uh, that he had a checkered past, but what is it about Ignatius that enduringly attracts you to him? You know, yeah, I think it really is that what I like about it, he, he was always passionate. So his conversion was not about becoming, like getting rid of his passions. Now, this was a guy, he was a passionate warrior, uh, 
uh, as he would call himself, you know, being a, a soldier for Spain and then becoming a soldier for Christ. But it wasn't about getting rid of his passions, but focusing his passions, that his passions would be about service, uh, being helping other people. And even when things didn't go his way, he had this big dream to go to the Holy Land. He wanted to be a missionary in the Holy Land. And that didn't work out. Uh, and so he then spent the rest of his life in Rome, where he helped build up the Society of Jesus and, and, and be that institutional leader, being able to write the constitutions and a lot of our documents and to guide through letters and, and, um, and through his leadership to be able to form this fledgling institution to make it what it is today and, and for all of us here. Uh, so he was able to accept his orders, uh, certainly his orders uh, he was seeing coming directly from Christ and through uh, the Holy Father, uh, the importance of, of that, uh, always operating within the church, but certainly inspired so much by the Holy Trinity to be of service and in a service that's always incarnate, always with people, always apostolic, uh, being clear that we're not monks, we're certainly, be, we're sp certainly supposed to pray, but to be contemplatives in action and always engage in the world, engage with other cultures, engage with other religions, engage with people different from us, uh, and to try to bring about this gospel message, this, this good news of God's love, redeeming love to everyone. Uh, so uh, Ignatius is a compelling character because he was always passionate. Uh, and he realized he made mistakes. He went too far in different things. He fasted too much at different times. Uh, certainly is is, is uh, fighting in uh, um, some of his, his wilder days in the past. Uh, he saw that he needed that conversion, but even on his, his early days as, as on this path, trying to figure out what he's supposed to do, he went way too far in different things. He was a man of extremes in many ways, but allowed himself to be taught by the master, taught by, by Christ to, um, to serve a Christ that is poor, humble, and even able to accept contempt, disdain, reproach, uh, be able to, to, to go wherever God has called him to be. Tom, uh, everybody here, at least most people who were with us mm -hmm. know uh, that the Jesuit process of training we call formation. And uh, the formation is long. Uh, I think it's not an exaggeration to say it's arduous. Um, and the intention is to uh, is, is to bring us to the experiences that will form us to be, to give us the sorts of experiences that Ignatius's first companions and Ignatius himself had, because we have such confidence that God works on us and forms us through our experiences. When you look back over your long years uh, of formation, what would you signal out, Tom, as the experiences that were most formative for you in, uh, in preparing you to be the priest, leader, uh, religious that, uh, that you are and that you aspire to be? Yeah, you know, so many. And but actually, I'll also say those six years at Fairfield Prep, uh, and I have to laugh because, you know, for, for most people, that, that really is like the pinnacle of your career. I mean, to, have, to be head of a school. But for me, it was, I mean, it was really just another stage of formation because I'm I'm now in my final stage of formation. I'm, I'm technically still a scholastic, even though I'm, I'm a ordained scholastic, but I'm not fully formed. And so I sort of saw it as that, you know, I was ordained in the priesthood, sent to Fairfield Prep. I spent one year where I was teaching Spanish and then transitioning, I was hired. Uh, so I spent a semester transitioning to this role and then five years learning how to be president um, and kind of doing the best I could with it, running around with my hair on fire most days. But, uh, um, but I always saw this like, being president of institution wasn't the, the be all and the end all of my life. So in terms of for, Jesuit formation, it's not for a job. And, and I'm okay if I'm you know, never head of a school again, or if, if I'm asked to do it again, fine. But I didn't join the Jesuits to, to do something or to be on any sort of career path. And it's more just like being formed to be more open to what God wants for me, uh, what God wants for God's people. And again, it, it, it really isn't about, so my development, my formation, my sort of uh, flourishing in different ways is not about just my own personal path of salvation, but how it can be helpful to other people. And, I, and for us as Jesuits, always keeping that service upfront about who we are and why we're doing anything, why we're in studies, why we're going on retreats, silent retreats, everything is just really to 
to give us greater capacity to be of service to others. And with this wealth, you know, really, as, as you know, like each one of, we have like a million dollar education. I mean, all of us, we have lots of degrees, but it's not about the degrees on the wall. Uh, it's about how can these, how can this academic formation be able to help those who will never have the opportunity to get a degree or to help other people that hopefully they do have the opportunity to go on and get a degree. And so for me, these, each stage of formation was just another way for me to grow in love for God and for the people around me. Uh, lots of times with our formation, we'll be thrown to these apostolic experiments with people who are tough to love. <laughs> you, know, so you work with homeless folks or somebody like that who are having a bad day. And, uh, and how do I find God there? And it's all constantly being challenged of, for finding God in all things, whatever it is. I certainly found God every day walking around the halls of Fairfield Prep. It was all over. The, God was all over the place with all this stuff. Uh, but at each stage of formation. And so, again, just to sort of backtrack on the formation that I've had that uh, first, I guess one thing that I'll mention that in some sense is kind of a blessing. <laughs> Sometimes our blessings don't look like blessings at first, but you know, I entered the Jesuits at one of the worst possible moments. So I entered, I'm teaching in a high school in Boston uh, from uh, 2001 to 2003. So my first week as a teacher at Catholic Memorial uh, was 9-11. And so again, the, the, the tragedy of that and trying to figure out how to be an adult in front of kids when you don't even know what's going on in the world. And then of course that year is when the whole spotlight series of of clerical abuse uh, was unfolding in Boston. And so Boston being ground zero of all of that, and I'm discerning entering the Jesuits uh, and possibly studying to be a priest. And so when I did enter the Jesuits in 2003, I thought, you know, like, well, nobody in their right mind would do this. <laughs> like, like they enter the Jesuits to study to be a priest in the middle of absolute crisis when Literally in Boston, everyone is leaving the church. I mean, it was just the floodgates were open and everybody was rightfully uh, so upset uh, with, with the church. And, and I felt called to enter. Now, part of it is me being a Marine. I like to like charge into like the, uh, the, the chaos. Uh, but the good thing is that I've kept that with me in that I've never, I've never doubted the fact that this vocation is of God. Because it couldn't have been by any logical human reason. It wasn't like I wanted to get more prestige or more anything because there was, certainly was no prestige as I was entering and, and certainly throughout at different times of my uh, Jesuit life. Um, so that's kind of strengthened me that, you know, times where things are difficult, you kind of question like, what am I doing? Uh -huh. uh, to have that with me, uh, that, you know, this, this vocation is of God. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. And so then the next stage... The first stage in Jesuit formation is the Novitiate, which was spent generally in Syracuse, New York, but you're constantly being sent on different missions, experiences. Uh, so, you know, I had the, uh, the opportunity to, for one semester, I was working in the county jail, uh, meeting, meeting men and women over there. Uh, one semester, I was working in the local hospital, I was working on a, their detox floor, and in they, they had a 28 day rehab program. And so work with folks that are struggling with addiction. Uh, spent three months in Jamaica teaching in a grammar school. Um, certainly the, the center of the whole thing is the 30 day uh, spiritual exercises, 30 day retreat. Um, also spent a semester at Boston College High School working in campus ministry. Uh, so a whole, and also a, a, um, six weeks in a palliative care cancer hospital in the Bronx, uh, just caring for people who were dying and, and providing that hands-on care. So those two years, those first two years, the novitiate is this trial period for the Society of Jesus and for the, the, the novice. And then professing first vows, which are lifetime perpetual vows of poverty, chastity, obedience, and promising to enter fully uh, the society. And then the next stage of my formation was philosophy studies. Typically, you go off for three years of what's called first studies. And, and here was a good lesson in the vows for me, because uh, I have to laugh that... Um, the, uh, the provincial asked me where, and the provincial this time was uh, Father Tom Regan. Many of the Fairfield U community may know him. He's a philosophy professor at Fairfield U for many years. So, uh, so I'm meeting with him and he, he asked me where I wanted to go for philosophy studies and there's different options. And I said, well, Loyola Chicago. And I gave good reasons for that. <clears throat> he said, well, have you ever thought about Chile? I said, no, I never think about Chile. 
And so he sent me to Chile for three years. <laughs> but when we were talking, he, uh, uh, I, had I you spoke I, in Spanish before, Tom. Had you? Yeah, so actually, I was working as a Spanish teacher, so I spoke Spanish, but it was conversational. It wasn't great. And, and I came back to him and I said, Well, you know, Tom, I mean, I'm happy to do it. I'll obviously, I'll go wherever you send me to go. But honestly, I don't think I can, I don't think I can do philosophy studies in Spanish. I mean, I, th I think that's well beyond me. Uh, so he said, no, 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 you'll do fine. Don't worry about it. And I thought, okay, well, uh, I did. And I, and actually I did well in my studies. I graduated with honors. Um, but that taught me a good lesson because I realized that left, like, actually for me, the vow of obedience is very freeing and it allows me to do more than I would do on my own. Because left to my own devices, I would have said, no, I can't do that. And I would have placed myself in a very small box of what I think I can do. And the society over all these years has kept saying, well, you know what, tell you what, we need you to do this anyhow. So, <laughs> and, and I've realized that with God's help, with God's grace, you can do a lot more than you think you can. And so for me, that vow of obedience, but really, however, each one of us vowed or not, are able to open ourselves to God's grace is expansive in that we, we do get the grace we need at each moment. So, uh, so yeah, three years in South America, basically I spent one semester in Bolivia and two and a half years in Chile, uh, studying philosophy and working in homeless shelters. Then two years teaching at Chevers High School in Portland. Um, let me stop you just for a yeah. second. Um, when you think about your time in Chile, um, you know, obviously as a Marine, you had served in Iraq, uh, Iraq, right? Uh, Kuwait. Kuwait, I'm sorry. Um, what was this experience like of being outside of your own country and immersed in another culture? Clearly, as you as you suggested in the very beginning, this is part of the Jesuit way that you enter through the door of one province, but you know that you you know you're likely to be sent anywhere in the world. And you very early on had that experience in Jamaica when you were a novice, but then you know under Tom Regan's uh, wise. Uh, wise governance, you found yourself for three years in Chile, which, by the way, prepared you for all your auxiliary ministries to the Spanish-speaking people of Bridgeport that, I, that I've seen you involved in. But um, what did you learn about yourself and as a Jesuit by being outside your culture, outside your language, outside your, your sort of field of, uh, of control? Because once you lose your language, you've lost a lot, right? As, as well as gained a lot. But my own experience is that you're de deracinated a little bit and you learn a lot about yourself and, and life and cultures. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a very good point. And, and for me, those three years in South America were a sort of purifying process, letting go of my ego. And in a lot of ways, I still have a lot, but, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I let go of a lot of it because you have to be so humble all the time. And first of all, when you find yourself, and even by the end of the time, my Spanish is pretty good. And as you alluded to too, like one thing I loved during those six years in Fairfield, I was celebrating mass in Spanish at St. Charles Borromeo on East Main Street in Spanish. And so to be able to, because of that experience, be able to minister to Latinos of, uh, of Bridgeport was total blessing that came out of that. Um, but it is tough because, you know, you're speaking like a child. And so people treat you like a child <laughs> and you get frustrated like, hey, I'm an adult, treat me like an adult but I just can't say that. Uh, and so there's, there's the frustration of it. It's the, no matter how close other cultures are, you never, you're never always on the same sheet of music. People think differently. They have different worldviews. And there's always a sense that you don't really feel understood where you are. Um, but then there's also, you know, wherever you go in the world, there's going to be an anti-Americanism and, and it kind of ebbs and flows depending on where you are and what's going on in the world. Certainly after we invaded Iraq in uh, 2003, here I am in 2005 in South America, and still uh, just so much anger about that. Uh, and people, as soon as they find out that I'm an American, like, you're President George Bush. And uh, so people- <laughs> You didn't well, then, mention at that stage that you had been a Marine. <laughs> yeah, I voted for Kerry too, but that's okay. <laughs> no, but they, and they knew that, and so they, um, uh, but then there was, there was also, uh, you know, just there was talk at that point, I think we were talking about building the wall also. And people were coming up to me, like talking about a wall and like, well, what wall? What are you talking about? But there was certainly at that point talking about building a wall in Mexico and, and people were, were really upset about that, our policy towards Cuba. And so as an American in another culture, you're just going to just accept it and realize it's always a process. 
first, people always project their images onto you. And you got to realize that no one is seeing the person at first. They're just seeing this straw man image. And so at first, you're just the American gringo. And actually, gringo is actually kind of a, a, a nice word, but you're still getting called a gringo all the time. And, uh, and you just realize that. And I realized in my own life, too, as a Jesuit, I mean, I show up someplace dressed like this. They're not going to know Tom Smisky. They're just going to see priests, whether that's good or bad. Um, and I'm going to always have certain projections, whether it's being male, being white, being um, uh, Catholic, being whatever, um, being Marine. And so I'm going to or showing up with certain Catholic circles and you're a Jesuit. Oh. <laughs> so, so you just realize that people will project stuff on you, but you just need time with them. And over time, you know, once you both get to know each other better, and because again, I'm projecting my stuff on them, it's just the human psychological transference that's happening that you both come to know and appreciate and, and really care for and respect each other a lot more, but it requires engagement over time. And, and that was sort of what taught me. So anywhere I show up, I'm okay if I, you know, at first, you know, it just stirs up a lot of stuff, but just to stay engaged with people and, um, and try to keep the focus on the other person and caring about them. And then, um, Good things will good things will happen. Thanks, Tom. Let me take one more step back to Novitiate, and then okay. we'll get to Regency. You mentioned one of the uh, Saint Ignatius always talked about experiments or experiencias, experiences that he took to be formative and also probative of the kind of men he would want to be companions in his society. And from the very beginning, he insisted that the experience uh, of accompanying and caring for the sick and the dying uh, were one of these probative and formative experiences that should never be le left out uh, yeah. of the formation of a Jesuit. What was your experience at Calvary? It was a Calvary hospital time? Calvary hospital, right, yeah. Which, Can you say a little bit about what that experience was like for you? Yeah, that is an unbelievable experience. And actually, just to tie in also to think like how being a Marine is uh, was helpful. I remember at the end of officer candidate school uh, that the drill instructors were telling us that, listen, we purposely were putting you through more than you can do. Like we actually were asking you to do, asking, asking. <laughs> <laughs> like Tom, we're even asking you. <laughs> more than anyone, anyone humanly can do. And so you're not going to be able to do everything you had to prioritize and stuff like that, but you had to fail. And so we're evaluating you on how you fail and things like that. And actually, a lot of the, the experiences as a Jesuit novice and beyond are putting you in positions where you literally have to fail. And you have to fail because you have to trust God. And you have to realize that my gifts, my talents, my will, my strengths are not going to be able to solve this reality I'm in right now. And, and for me to, to, to realize, and it brings to light my own shortcomings that need some work, um, so now I can see them and work on them. But also I, I come to realize more and more how much I truly depend on God and how much we, we all do in this world. And so Calvary Hospital was the one that was the hardest for me. And, and I'll admit too that this was the one experience of all the things we did, I did not want to do. Because this would be really, uh, this was going to be hard. So we were going <laughs> to be hard. And so, so this is a palliative care care hospital so mostly cancer patients some AIDS patients and we we're going to care for them in their final days and it's amazing because we as Jesuit novices after a short little training program were so two of us would be assigned you know three or four patients and we would be working with them we'd have to do all the care and so uh, we would have to you know so basically bathe them in the morning feed them uh, uh, change put catheters on the we just have male patients put catheters on them, uh, change their diapers, give enemas at times. Uh, so it was really hands-on and hard, heavy work. Again, changing people's sheets with them in the bed is physical. And, and it was really, uh, again, we realized our own shortcomings that, so basically myself and my novice partner there, this guy, Cesare Campagnoli, who's, served, he's a pastor in, in, uh, in Italy right now, but Cesare and I, and it was funny too, because Cesare was a medical doctor before entering the society, but we couldn't tell anyone that. So we had to keep that to ourselves. So he, he was an MD with a PhD in fetal medicine. 
and we couldn't tell anyone. And we're just doing this hands-on stuff. And we would be exhausted. Like we could barely get through four patients care. And these were all like, generally there were Caribbean women who were doing this and each one of them had five patients and they could do eat five patients a day, no problem. And Chesaday and I are <laughs> doing everything we can being worn out. And then over the course of these six weeks, pretty much all of the, the patients we were working for uh, died. And, and to be with them in those final days and even when they, when they, when they expired, as they would say, that to prepare the body and bring the body to the morgue. And so really hard. And I know my parents are on this call too. My mom knows growing up, I didn't like smells. I had a sensitive nose. And so <laughs> there's a lot of smells involved in an operation like this that, that I didn't like and I didn't want to do. And at first, and here's for me the conversion. At first, every time we'd go into somebody's room, I, all I thought about was like, like, for me, they were like a problem. Like, oh God, I got to change this guy's diapers. I, I need to, I, I need to feed him. And then I'm gonna have to change his diapers again. And then all this. And so for me, I, I first started thinking like, ah, like this was a problem that I don't want to do. But by the end, you start, you get to know the people and you really care about them. And then you really love them. And by the end, I was like, whatever I could do to make them happy. If it was for them to be clean, for them to be fed, and in these times where some of them had a great appetite and feeding them away, I'm like, this, this is, <laughs> I know I'm going to be uh, changing a diaper after this, uh, but I'm, I'm so happy. This guy is, ha he's just having, he's having a great meal for himself. He's happy. And so by the end, I was, I really was happy to care for mm. all of these patients and all that other stuff didn't even matter anymore. And that's mm. where I realized something had happened and, and God certainly softening my hard heart. Uh, which has helped me so many other times too, that if I keep things focused on the person um, and how God is at work in this person and in me in the process, everything else is, is really not an issue at that point. Thank you, Tom. Tom, I'm going to skip over, if it's okay, the rest of your formation, because I don't want to lose the opportunity before we finish to talk about what you're doing in the Pacific Northwest, touch on Washington, touch on what may still be coming. But before we get into that, that final segment, um, I don't want us to leave uh, Fairfield Prep uh, that for so many people is their touchstone with you. When you look back over those six years, You've alluded to the blessings that you received. If you were to signal the greatest consolations uh, or the greatest gifts that you feel uh, you received by being there, where your heart was moved most and where you say you found God or God touched you most strongly, what would you say they would be, Tom? Yeah, you know, it was it was always with the people you're around and everything else and to you know, to be able to work with, to cultivate leadership in the school. Uh, certain things I, I love every year. I just love the, like we have a faculty staff retreat. Um, I love being around, going on the Kairos retreats. I make sure I went to every Kairos for one afternoon, evening, and just to hang out with the students, laugh with them at the tables and stuff. To be around the students, to be shaking their hands at different times. But there's certain moments that like would always be really emotional for me. And uh, one was always the SEED dinner. SEED was our diversity program, is our diversity program, uh, Students for Educational Excellence Through Diversity. Uh, and again, that was founded by Dr. Donna Arndrod, and who has just been named to, talk about incredible, Donna was just named to Father General's um, Committee on Women. And um, that's like there's like six, people, six or eight people in the world. And Dr. Donna Andrade, Fairfield Preps, Dean of Mission and Ministry is one of those people. And, uh, and she's been a leader with diversity and, and Jesuit mission, Jesuit education for so many years. So, so that was incredible. But, and then uh, Alicia Thomas and now Ruben Goodwin are, are directors of the SEED program. And, uh, and every year with, there's this big banquet at the end. And you know the, the students are talking about their experiences. The parents are talking about their experiences. And you would just see like, wow, like, we are changing the world. And, and every time, you know, you, you bring in some, you know, one, one of these students comes to prep, any one of our students comes to prep, you know, their whole family comes to prep and, and gets that prep experience mm -hmm. and, and how everybody wins too, you know? So where else, especially in Southern Connecticut, 
do you have kids from Bridgeport and Greenwich and uh, Darien and Shelton and uh, and all over the place from all different backgrounds? And they come together, and they become best friends. And then you see in their families become great friends with one another. And, and to see how, mm-hmm. you know, a kid who in any school district, you know, whether it's whether it's Greenwich or Bridgeport or whatever, um, that their life could have been on a certain track. And now it and all of their family are on a very different track in life. And, and just to hear that, like the, the testimonials from the parents at the seed dinner, I would I would be crying every time listening to them mm-hmm. hearing that. Um, but yeah, so many different moments, especially with people and in the tragedies. And, and I felt blessed. It was powerful to be a, a priest president and to feel that I was the pastor of this community. Uh, even the sad moments, you know, tragedies like death and things and, and joyful moments. Um, it was, it was a great place to learn how to be a priest. I mean, I, I came to Fairfield Prep right after being ordained to the priesthood and, and what a place between Fairfield Prep and again, St. Charles in uh, on East Main Street, Bridgeport. Um, the t- two communities that really support me as I, as I grew in, in this ministry. Tom, you know, thank you, Tom. Um, having described these beautiful and powerful experiences, um, and especially the time at prep, what sense do you make of this crazy uh, last stage of Jesuit formation, the tertianship, the third year of, uh, of novitiate, uh, or what Ignatius and the early Jesuits called the Scola Affectus, the school of the heart. Is it, is it a mere formality? Was it a mistake? Or in your own experience, do you, do you experience this, uh, this tertianship in such a way as that it really makes sense to you in terms of your own human and religious development? Yeah, this is, this is an incredible gift. You know, St. Ignatius was brilliant on a lot of different levels, but especially in terms of formation in, in humanism was, is so important to Ignatian spirituality, this Ignatian humanism and, and, and keeping that, that focus on the person always. And so like a couple of different things like regencies, that stage of working typically teaching in a high school between philosophy studies and theology studies, the most welcome break when you need to just get out and work and, and and do something and, and, and do that ministry full time. And now this stage here that after, you know, a lot of studies, a lot of formation, uh, six years of really an active apostolate, it's in one sense, it's a nice rest. It's quasi sabbatical. Uh, typically it's a nine month program, but this being COVID, all things have changed this year. And I was supposed to go to Salamanca, Spain for this program, which would have been nice. Spain's good, you know, so uh, food's pretty good. People are very good. Um, but of course, COVID has changed everybody's plans to at least plan B. And so I couldn't get the visa to go to Spain, uh, but things worked out even better than I could have expected. And so this fall, this tertiary program in Portland, Oregon, they decided to push their start and compress it to just January through May. And so then I had the fall, I'm like, oh, what am I gonna do for the fall? And so talking with the uh, province staff, they asked me to go down to Holy Trinity Parish down in Georgetown for the fall. And so I spent the fall semester in DC. And then here I'm in Portland, Oregon. We do a lot of weekend hikes around uh, here in the Pacific Northwest. And I'm like, oh, this is great. This is like the, uh, the great American adventure here where I've been able to see two amazing parts of the country. Historical being Washington DC this fall. I left, uh, I arrived, August 31st, and I left right after the insurrection and right before the inauguration. So I felt like I, I was there for a lot. Um, and now this tertianship, basically, this is, uh, you would normally have an apostolic experiment, which the fall sort of became that for me. And the key thing is to do the 30-day spiritual exercises again. Beautiful experience, especially to, be, to bring all of this to prayer. It was, it was a pretty busy uh, six years at PrEP. Uh, it was graced in many ways. In other ways, I was kind of beat up uh, by the time it was all over because <laughs> there's a lot going on. Uh, and to bring all that to prayer and to have God redeem all of it, right? So it's it, to see grace in all of it. And uh, and now the rest of the time is spent with these conferences where me, and it's, it's just a small group of this three Jesuits on staff and there's five of us tertians. And we're studying things like Ignatius's autobiography, 
the formula of the Institute, the Constitutions, Vatican II documents. So it's kind of like an in-depth course on Jesuit spirituality, history, governance, uh, to prepare us for, for leadership in the society, uh, to prepare us for final vows, full incorporation into the society. So it's been a great time. I finish up May 14th, and then I'll actually be coming back to Fairfield. I'll visit my parents first. I'll fly back to Boston, visit my folks, and come down to Fairfield. I'll wait my next assignment. But uh, but yeah, this has been good. And I'm every day I wake up, I am so grateful that I'm not trying to run a school in the middle of COVID. So I'll just take that right there. That's <laughs> okay. Tom, what Patrick comes doing next? An awesome job right now. Yeah, good for what him. What comes next? And so next, what I have, I have my mission. I just have to figure out how to get there. But uh, but I'm going. You have your uh, snowshoes, right? You have your yeah, snowshoes I, ready. That may be how I get there because I've been mission to the Russian region. And I've actually worked in the Russian region now four times, but basically they'd like me to go to, in Tomsk, Russia, so in Siberia, there we have a Jesuit parish and a very small pre-K through 11 school. And it's the only Catholic school in uh, Russia. There's, there's, a, there's a K through four school in Novosibirsk, but this is the only one that actually goes through pre-secondary and, and secondary education. Um, so it's certainly the only Catholic high school uh, in all of Russia. And so to, uh, I don't have a job title yet, but just to get there and just like do stuff. And, uh, and so to, to do that, unfortunately, again, there'll be visa complications with all this stuff. So I have to get there and things are complicated, but they're working on it, trying to figure out how to get me in uh, on some visa so I can get over there. COVID has closed all these borders, but, uh, but I'm excited for that next mission. Again, to be in education, to be in secondary education again, I love. Uh, to be with uh, Catholics in a very marginalized and a very poor country. That once you get outside of the Russian oligarchs, the Russians, it's a pretty poor country, uh, but good people. And like every, everywhere you go, God is already there and good people are there. So you can't go wrong to be there. And so I'm looking forward to, to being of service to, um, to Russians. And what I like about the school is that it's only 20% Catholic. So it's a good chance to engage with uh, with Russian Orthodox, with Muslims, with atheists. Um, and so to, I think there's probably a few Protestants there. Uh, Protestants have, have a very hard time. Uh, Russian government has been very hard on, on different Protestant churches. But to be able to work with other, uh, other faith traditions and just other good people and to allow them to understand uh, what we're all about with, with our nation's spirituality. So I'm excited for that. Um, I'm sure if God wants me there, God will get me there and it'll work out. If, if I have to put the snowshoes on and walk across the Bering Strait, we'll make it happen. Well, you've had plenty of experiences climbing tall buildings and swimming across bodies of water. So I can see you trudging across, across this, the, uh, the Bering Strait to get into <laughs> Siberia, Tom. <laughs> With you, there's a will, there's a way. We'll, we'll get there. That's it. It'll, it'll happen. And, and again, eat, no matter what, though, always that Ignatian indifference so that I am... I'm excited about it, but no matter what happens, it's kind of like, you know, Spain didn't happen for tertianship, but something even better happened. And so, um, you know, it'll, it'll work out in God's time with God's plans. And, uh, and what's nice is that about life as a Jesuit allows you that sort of freedom that I realize I'm not on a career path. I'm not trying to achieve much of anything in life, uh, but I'm just trying to, uh, you know, try to help people out, be a good person. And, to bring to others what I know works for me. So whether it's the, the good news of the gospel, whether it's Ignatian spirituality, that to uh, try to help others and, uh, and, you know, encounter some, some tools that might be able to help them in their lives and, and to bring some sort of hope and joy to people who don't always have that. Tom, it's been great to have you home among us and to have this opportunity to invite you to share uh, with us what's been going on these last few months, but then from the vantage point of these last few months to share with us what you see about the past and the confidence and joy uh, and peace that you feel uh, about the future. We have a few more minutes. Would anyone like to ask any questions? Uh, please, you're welcome to submit them now. Okay. If, they're not, if they're not too outrageous, I'll, I'll uh, pass them on to Tom. Well, well I Larry Vitrilano says you bring us all so much hope. Amen. I, thank you, Larry. I see your comments there. Yeah, yeah see it's okay, really great to see you, Tom. And just 
you know, I, I know you don't appreciate it because of your humility, but, you know, you, your energy and your positivity just radiates out. I always felt that in our friendship that, you know, no matter what was going on, you find the light and, and, and you spread it in a way that's just so humble and, and unassuming that, uh, you know, you, you're, um, you're, you're competitive and you're just totally non-competitive at the same time. I mean, I love that about you. I mean it. Well, thank you, Larry. And, and again, I feel blessed to have met great people like, uh, like you and Donna and, uh, and so many through here. I see this question from, from uh, Barry Ryan, who I'll get to also. But actually, I'm just looking across the screen. Dana Cavanaugh, I can't believe I ran into Jack uh, when I was uh, one of the days walking around through Georgetown streets there. So it was good to catch up with didn't him. didn't happen to be a bar, did it, Tom? No, no, I was actually oh. on my way to Mass, too. So oh, I was. <laughs> oh, Jack, you met Jack on his way to Mass. That's great, Dana. <laughs> I don't, I don't know of if he course, was. Of course, of course. He was at, I know he was going to Trinity. He was right, yeah. he was right on 35th Street, right, Tom? He was right around the corner from where we were. I ran into him. I was I was heading up, up to Holy Road to, to go celebrate an outdoor mass at the cemetery. But yeah, it was great to see him. And he's going to be, uh, he'll be getting commissioned as a Marine officer this spring. So great news there. Yeah, he was so happy to see you. And he, and I can't wait. He'll tell, he'll see you in May when you're coming back to Fairfield. Awesome. That'd, That'd be, be great. great. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. So you better, all of you better book your appointments and your dinner engagements and your lunch engagements and your breakfast engagements early on. So but, more questions, more fan mail. Yeah, let me go to that. But first I'll say, yeah, don't book on May 25th. I have jury duty in Bridgeport on May, May 25th. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Watch my home visit be taken up with some massive murder trial or something like that. We'll see. Remember, least, God has a strange way, Tom, of giving you what you need, <laughs> even if it's not what you want. I know. Now I see Barry Ryan has a great question. Was Ignatian spirituality developed fully during Ignatius' lifetime or has it developed over the centuries since and still in development? And Barry, I would say it's really still in development and it is a, um, it's really Ignatius, it came out of his uh, really mystical experience at the River Cardona uh, before uh, he brought this group together as early on, soon after his conversion. And it was one that kept working it out by offering these exercises, directing people in their retreats, sharing it with others. And, but then it was like, kind of, he says that like Peter Faber gave the exercises better than him even. And so it was really by a lot of other people giving these exercises, them compiling notes and ideas. And even now that, you know, you do see so many different men and women who are, who are directing uh, the spiritual exercises and all of this, this, this corpus of, experience and wisdom that comes together on this too. You know, one of the important things to realize as Tom is suggesting is that, uh, you know, as the exercises flow through other people's experience, they come up with insights. Uh, and certainly um, this is not to be politically correct, but the, uh, the, the for example, the, the formation that we give to people like Donna Andrade and uh, Elliot Gualteri and John Hanrahan uh, to have uh, married people, uh, men and women, experiencing the exercises and then being able to translate the exercises into the experience and categories of people of our own time is part of the ongoing development. I think the core, as Tom says, is there because of the gifts that God gave to Ignatius. But then the continued translation, adaptation, application of Ignatian spirituality, so it grows. If it doesn't grow, it's dead. Tom, somebody wants to know whether you're still a Tom Brady fan. Uh, what kind of question is that? Of course. Trish and Peter, of course I still am. So I was, what now here's how weird this COVID year has become. I mean, here I became a Buccaneers fan. Like nothing, everything is upside down in this world here now. So yeah, <laughs> I, I was more of a Tom Brady and Gronk fan than actually a uh, Buccaneers fan, but I rooted for him. Tom, I'm not sure I can, whether I'm, I can really answer this, but somebody wants to know whether you were always a good, good pious boy going to church and how much your parents' example contributed to that. So I, know, I don't know whether you want to answer that candidly that's, since your parents I, here. I, I, that's right. I, you. I see Betsy's question out there. I, listen, mm. Betsy, are you trying to get me in trouble here or something? Or what? Sounds like it. <laughs> Sounds like it. Uh, and so, you know, again, it's a little ebb and flow of my, uh, ah, my religious ah, practice. Ebb and flow. So I certainly grew up. I was an altar boy at church when I was a young kid, and then kind of uh, post Catholic high school, it was a little bit of a little drift. But you end up where God wants you to be. So God's will cannot be denied. And the firm foundation, not to throw flowers at your parents, but the firm foundation of their own example, and your you know your family's own commitment to Ignatian spirituality. In fact, 
I know it. My mother is uh, certainly she is a, a very prayerful person and uh, and actually does goes goes on a lot of retreats and gives a lot of retreats. And say so with both the support of my, my father and my mother, uh, two great influences in my life and in my sister and, and her family uh, to have that love, to have that support frees you up to be able to do anything. Thank you, Tom. The, the love and the support, you know, more than the formal, the aspects of formal religious uh, training. Yeah. Any more questions? Otherwise, we'll call it a night. Tom, last words of wisdom. Uh, no, just gratitude. Um, you know, the nation says we should always begin with gratitude, but it's not too, not a bad idea to end with gratitude also. And just, you know, I'm grateful for all the good people that supported me. Again, when I came to Fairfield Prep, I had some teaching experience. I had some leadership experience. I had never been a school administrator. And then all of a sudden thrown into this and uh, asked to do this by the society. Um, did the best I could and uh, overall worked out pretty well. There's, there's certainly some people who, uh, who wouldn't agree with that. That's always the case uh, with some tough decisions you have to make over the years. But, uh, but, but I was able to do all that because of the good people. And one thing that, you know, I was, what was really neat is, uh, you know, my first year, you know, you do what all first year presidents do. You put together a, a strategic plan. And, and I was really going into this, talking to other presidents, like, well, how do you do a strategic plan? And, it was really kind of important. It felt like, you know, as a Jedi, you have to make your own lightsaber. You know, you're not a Jedi until you make your lightsaber. Well, you're not a high school president until you make your strategic plan. And, and over the course of those five years, we achieved almost everything on it. And, uh, and I felt good about that. And it was a lot of stuff. It was from everything from the, you know, the fine arts floor to the expanded, uh, really athletic complex now in the basement of Arupe to all the, uh, the Barrett Science Center on fourth floor Xavier to the McLeod Innovation Center on the lower level of Xavier to air conditioning Arupe, air conditioning most of Xavier now, replacing all the plumbing in all these buildings, 70 year old plumbing to uh, endowing the Dean of Mission and Ministry. There was, uh, there was so much that was achieved over this time. And I'm always happy to say not one of those was my idea. And it was all just like going around talking to people say, hey, what, do we, like, what should we do? And you know, Fairfield Preps a community where people are passionate, they've been thinking about this, they've got a lot of good ideas. And it was really just a matter of like collecting the ideas, synthesizing it, keeping everyone together because a lot of passion people can spin off in different directions, but keeping everyone focused and together and moving. And we achieved all of those. And, and I'm happy to say I didn't have one of those good ideas. It was just a matter of bringing together that. And that was my, my job. We all, you know, we all have our role in the team. Each position is different. I had my position and my job was just to bring together the good ideas, the energy that was already there and is still there. Uh, and just focus that forward. And we were able to accomplish a lot. Thank you, Tom. Blessings on the last months of your tertianship. Have a great Holy Week and a blessed Easter. Everybody misses you, loves you, and looks forward to the brief time we'll have back with you when you come back as you await your next assignment. And thank all of you for joining us for this evening. And welcome thank you, Tom. Both, and thank you all so much. And Father Tom didn't even realize this, but he actually gave us a commercial for our next one of these events, which is going to feature Father Tom Regan. So that oh, will be excellent. on April 20th. And we'll uh, make sure you guys all get the info for that if you want to sign up and join us on April 20th at 7 p.m. Thank you all and have a wonderful Easter, a wonderful rest of this week. And we will see you all again soon. Thanks, Tom.